All our issues in the East can be traced to treachery. Nothing else but treachery. Steiner! Steiner and his troops are to attack immediately from their positions in the Eberswalde on the flank of Manteuffel's Third Panzer Army. It had been decided at the Führer's conference to turn General Vank's 12th Army away from its positions on the Western Front. Vank will launch an attack toward the East and Berlin, relieving the pressure for 9th Army. You cannot sacrifice these children for a cause that is already lost. I will not use them, and I want you to cancel this order. Steiner does not have the strength to make such an attack. I reject this order. I insist on the withdrawal of the 9th Army. Now, I tell you, if this final request is not approved, then I must demand to be released from my post. Can I have an appointment with the Führer to discuss the situation? The heavy fighting on the Oder in April 1945 was the last German strategic engagement on the Eastern Front and it literally resulted in the opening of the road to Berlin for the Red Army. In the last episode we detailed the difficulties encountered by Zhukov's first Belarusian Front to break through the German lines at Zillow and his subsequent decision to commit the tank armies ahead of time in order to bulldoze his way to Berlin. Although this decision was criticised by many, including Stalin, it nevertheless achieved its objective. The German defence at Zillow began to crumble away. Now let's investigate this key event from the German perspective. We already know about Hitler's belief that the main Soviet offensive was aimed at Prague, not at Berlin. And, for this reason, he refused to provide Heinrichi with the strategic reserves he requested for the Oder Front. We've also learned that Bus's 9th Army could only hold its positions and resist the Soviet onslaught for three days before finally collapsing. Let's detail these three days as seen from a German point of view, with a particular focus on the Panzer divisions that played a key role in this final stage of the war. For 9th Army, the first day of fighting was already hard. Two important issues arose at once. The premature commitment of almost all its reserves and the very high losses suffered by the infantry units. Yet Busser resisted the first assault, and Zhukov ended up extremely disappointed. He fell into the trap set by Heinrichsi. He wasted his artillery barrage on almost empty positions. His spotlight idea was a fiasco. His losses were appalling in men and tanks. So that if the first day was a hard one for the Germans, it was a disaster for the Soviets. Both sides feverishly regrouped forces for what was to come next. Facing this difficult situation, the OKW was forced to release from reserve the 18th and 25th Panzer Grenadier Divisions, which left in the evening for Münchenberg to join General Weidling's 56th Panzer Corps. Heinrichsi wanted to use these forces to counterattack the Russians ahead of Münchenberg. Hitler decided otherwise and directed the first towards Zillow and the second towards Writzen. But even more important than infantry were the armoured units. Busser desperately called for panzers to counter the looming Soviet breakthrough. Initially reluctant, Hitler eventually agreed to give all he had left, the SS Panzer Grenadier Divisions Nederland and Nordland, along with the tank destroyer brigades Pirat and Dorn. In addition, around 10 alarm battalions, comprising 50% of Hitler youth teenagers, were transported by bus from Berlin to the Munchenberg region. On the night of the 18th of April, the two SS divisions began to head south. There were no more than 60 kilometers to cover on small roads, but the destroyed bridges, the intense traffic and the lack of fuel explained the piecemeal arrival of the SS near Munchenberg only in the morning. Of these two units, the Nordland division, led by Gruppenführer Ziegler, although badly mauled in Pomerania, was the most able, or rather the less weak. It had 3,000 men, 24 Sturmgeschütz and 10 Jagdpanzer IV. But its best asset 
was the Heavy Battalion 503, the unit which possesses the highest number of hits per day of the entire war, despite its recent creation only four months ago. Its leader, Sturmbannführer Herzig, had 12 Königstigers at his disposal, covered by half a dozen Verbalwind with quadruple 20mm flak guns. These two weapons, each in their category, were unparalleled in the armies of the time. As for the Niederlande Division, it was actually a Kampfgruppe of a thousand men, made from General Seifert's 48th SS Panzergrenadier Regiment, with its heavy weapons, Sturmgeschütze and Jagdpanzers. At 56 Panzer Corps headquarters, General Weidling was bewildered. The reinforcements he had expected did not show up during the night. In early morning, one man from the Nordland Division did show up, the commander, Major General Ziegler. He announced calmly that his division was still miles away. He had run out of fuel. Weidling was livid. Every Panzer Division carried reserves for such emergencies. But Ziegler, who disliked fighting under Wehrmacht officers, apparently did not consider his division's arrival urgent. Now twenty precious hours had been lost in refueling, and Ziegler was not in position. And the setbacks continued. The 18th Panzer Grenadier Division, which should have reached Weidling the day before, on the 17th, had just arrived. The counter-attacks that had been planned for this force would not take place. The division had arrived just in time to retreat. But the greatest disaster was linked to Goring's 9th Parachute Division. This unit had worried Heinrichsee, even before the fighting. And when Zhukov's column surged out from Zelo Heights, Goring's paratroopers panicked and broke as the Russian tanks, guns blazing, smashed into their lines. Colonel Verlemann, Weidling's artillery commander, witnessed the rout that followed. Everywhere soldiers were running away like madmen. Drawing my pistol did not help stem the tide. I found the division's commander utterly alone and completely downcast by the flight of his men, trying to hold back whatever there was left to hold back. Eventually the headlong flight was contained, but these much vaunted paratroopers remain a threat to the rest of the fighting. As for Heinrichi, when he heard the news, he rang Goring directly. He said acidly, I have something to tell you. Those casino troops of yours, those famous paratroopers, well, they have run away. Although Weidling tried desperately to stem the Russian armoured assaults, his front could not hold. His chief of staff, von Dufing, reported, The Russians are beginning to force us back by applying terrific pressure in a kind of horseshoe-like manoeuvre. Hitting us from both sides, then encircling us again and again. The Corps is also subjected to heavy aviation attacks. Weidling had lost communication with Busse's headquarters. At nightfall, the leader of the Hitler Youth, Arthur Axman, arrived. He brought news he was sure would please Weidling. His youngsters, he announced, were ready to fight and were even now manning the roads in 56 Panzer Corps' rear area. My youngsters are ready to fight. Right now, they are already manning the roads in the rear of 56 Panzer Corps. Weidling's reaction to the news was not what Axman had expected. He was so enraged that for a moment he was almost inarticulate. Then using extremely coarse language, he said angrily, You cannot sacrifice these children for a cause that is already lost. I will not use them, and I want you to cancel this order. The pudgy Axman hurriedly gave Weidling his word that the order would be countermanded. Now that we've seen the details of the Red Army's breakthrough on the order from April 16 to 19, let's develop the three days that followed. From April 20 to 23, the troops of the 1st Belarusian Front and the 1st Ukrainian Front managed to encircle the German forces of Army Group Vistula, southeast of Berlin. We'll see what desperate measures the German High Command took to try and save the situation. We'll hear the names of Steiner and Wenck during a famous Hitler conference. Then, in the next episode, we'll concentrate on the capture of Berlin itself in the last days of April and the 1st of May, thus completing our series. The 20th of April. As the Oder Front was ripped apart, Goebbels' propaganda ministry could not ignore the threat any longer. The Nazi Party newspaper, Volkische Beobachter, said, A new and heavy trial, perhaps the heaviest of all, is before us. 
Each square meter of territory which the enemy has to fight for, each Soviet tank, which a grenadier, a Volkstrom man, or a Hitler lad destroys, bears more weight today than at any other time in this war. The word for the day is, clench your teeth. Fight like the devil. Do not give up one foot of soil easily. The hour of decision demands the last, the greatest effort. On the afternoon of the 18th, General Raymond, chief of the Berlin garrison, received an order from the Reichskanzlei, later confirmed by a personal call from Goebbels, that all forces available, including Volkssturm, have been requested by the 9th Army to hold the second line positions. In other words, the city was to be stripped to man the outer defences. Raymond was astounded. Hurriedly, ten Volkssturm battalions were rounded up along with a regiment of anti-aircraft defence units of the Grossdeutschland Guard Regiment. After hours of search and requisition, a miscellaneous collection of vehicles was assembled and the force headed east. As he watched them go, Raymond turned to Goebbels' deputy. Tell Goebbels that it is no longer possible to defend the Reich capital. The inhabitants are defenceless. Under the present circumstances, Heinrichi knew Berlin could not be defended. He had no intention of allowing his armies to fall back into the city. Tanks would not be able to manoeuvre there. Because of the buildings, artillery could not be used. They would have no field of fire. At all costs, Heinrichi hoped to avoid the horror of block-to-block -block street street-to-street fighting. His main concern at the moment was Bus's army. He was sure that if he was not pulled back quickly, it would be encircled. After a visit to the front this same day, he notified Krebs at the German High Command. I have driven all over the front. Signs of disintegration are everywhere. Roads are covered with the vehicles of refugees, often with military transport among them. For the first time I ran into troops who were obviously retreating. On the way to Eberswalde, I didn't find one soldier who didn't claim to have orders to get munitions, fuel or something else from the rear. It was appalling. South of Eberswalde, the road was jammed with civilians and soldiers. I had to order the NCOs to turn their men around. At Schönholz, I saw younger officers inactive and just looking around. They had to be energetically ordered to build a line and catch scattered troops. The forests between there and Trampe are filled with groups of soldiers either resting or retreating. No one claimed to have any orders or assignments. In another area there was a tank renaissance section resting next to its parked vehicles. I ordered the unit to move on Biesenthal at once and recapture this critical crossroads. There was so much confusion around Eberswalde that no one could tell me if a front existed at all. I cannot accept responsibility or direct this situation if Pussy's army is not withdrawn immediately. I'm asking you to tell that to the Führer. 21st of April. In the Führerbunker, Hitler's nightly military conference broke up at 0300 hours. During the meeting, Hitler had blamed the 4th Army, that had been crushed by Konev's attack in the very first day of his offensive, for all the problems that had since arisen. He accused the army of treason. The attendees were taken back. Krebs asked, My Führer, do you really believe that the command committed treason? Hitler looked at him with pitying eyes, as if only a fool could ask such a stupid question. All our issues in the East can be traced to treachery! Nothing else but treachery! His finger stabbing the map, he shouted, Steiner! 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 For Hitler, the answer to this situation was obvious. SS General Felix Steiner. Steiner and his troops are to attack immediately from their positions in the Eberswalde on the flank of Manteuffel's Third Panzer Army. Then they are to head south, cutting off the Russians' drive on Berlin. Steiner's attack will close the gap that had opened on the northern flank of Bussy's army. On Hitler's map it appeared a brilliant move. Zhukov's drive now looked like an arrowhead, its base on the Oder, its tip pointing directly at Berlin. Along Zhukov's northern flank was the little flag that said Group Steiner. Hitler was confident once more Steiner's attack would re-establish contact between the 3rd and 9th armies. There was only one thing wrong with the Führer's scheme. Steiner had virtually no men. Earlier Heinrichi had decided to place under Steiner the 9th Army troops 
that had been shoved to the north by the Russian drive. Unfortunately, the widespread confusion at the front and the lack of time had made it impossible to gather sufficient forces to make the Group Steiner operational. In effect, there was no Group Steiner, but the name had stuck and so had the little flag on Hitler's map. Now Hitler phoned Steiner. The general remembered his exact words. Steiner, are you aware that the Reichsmarschall has a private army at Karinhal? This is to be disbanded at once and sent into battle. Whilst Steiner tried to figure out what that was supposed to mean, Hitler continued. Every available man between Berlin and the Baltic Sea up to Stettin and Hamburg is to be drawn into this attack I have ordered. Steiner vainly tried to protest, saying that the troops at his disposal were inexperienced and when asked precisely where the attack was to take place, Hitler gave him no answer. He simply ended the conversation. Steiner then called Krebs, telling he had no idea where or when or with what he was to attack. But when he began to explain that his troops were totally inexperienced and without heavy weapons, Hitler suddenly cut in on the conversation. You will see, Steiner, you will see. The Russians will suffer their greatest defeat before the gates of Berlin. Shortly thereafter, Steiner received the official order to attack. The last paragraph read, It is expressly forbidden to fall back to the West. Officers who do not comply unconditionally with this order are to be shot right away. You, Steiner, are liable with your head for the execution of this order. The fate of the Reich capital depends on the success of your mission. This was signed Adolf Hitler. After his conversation with Steiner, Hitler called the Luftwaffe's chief of staff, General Kohler, and said threateningly, All Air Force personnel in the northern zone who can be made available are to be placed at the disposal of Steiner and brought to him. Any commanding officer who keeps back personnel will be shot. They must be told of this. You, yourself, will guarantee with your own head that absolutely every man is employed. Kohler was dumbfounded. It was the first he had heard of Group Steiner. He called Krebs and asked where Steiner was. The chief of staff cryptically answered, I can't tell you at this moment, but I promise to find out as quickly as possible. Throughout this frantic period, Heinrichi knew nothing at all about the scheme. When he finally heard, he called Krebs at once. Steiner does not have the strength to make such an attack. I reject this order. I insist on the withdrawal of the Ninth Army. Otherwise, Krebs, the only troop unit still in position to defend Hitler and Berlin, will be lost. Now, I tell you, if this final request is not approved, then I must demand to be released from my post. Can I have an appointment with the Führer to discuss the situation? It's just not possible. The Führer is overworked. I appeal to the highest officials to bear in mind the responsibilities they bore to the troops. That responsibility is borne by the Fuhrer. You need to know that Ninth Army would be split into several parts by nightfall. Don't worry. Schoener would right the situation by driving north to link up with Busa. It will take Schoener several days to mount an attack. By then the Ninth will no longer exist. You nail my forces down while you tell me that I must do all I can to avoid the shame of the Führer being encircled in Berlin? Against my will, in spite of my request to be relieved of my duties, I am being prevented from pulling out the only forces that can be used for the protection of the Führer and Berlin. It is my conviction that this is the last moment to withdraw the Ninth Army. It had been decided at the Führer's conference to turn General Wank's 12th Army away from its positions on the Western Front. Wank will launch an attack toward the East and Berlin, relieving the pressure for 9th Army. They will be most welcome. Krebs just told me that Army Wank is to turn around and march in your direction. You should pull out your strongest division. Break through the Russians and head west to meet Wenk. But that would lose me the bulk of my forces! No arguing. This is the order for Ninth Army. Pull out one division and get it underway to join with Wenk. <laughs> 